Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Kendra, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, My sobriety date is June 20 of last year. Uh, I have a home group called Water's Edge. It's at 7 a.m. every day out by Gasworks, if you want to check that out. I have a sponsor named Kim, who's graciously come today, and um, I work the steps with her. Uh, Thank you, Emily, very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I've not done a speaker's meeting myself, but this is one of the first meetings I ever went to. And it always gave me a lot of peace. And when I was new in sobriety, I would love speakers meetings because you didn't have to talk. I just got to sit. It was awesome. Um, So my story starts here, really close to here, because I grew up about four blocks away. And I grew up in Ballard in the 70s when it was not hip or interesting or cool. It was the middle of nowhere and quiet and hard to get in and out of. This is also the busing generation. So I got sent across town to Queen Anne and Magnolia in the central districts. And even before I drank, I felt out of place. I felt odd and different and awkward, and I didn't like it at all. And I guess now looking back, that was that restless, irritable, and discontent. And I thought it was just me. I thought I was uniquely awkward and suffering and alone in a way that no one else could understand. But I've happily come to find out that it's not as unique and crazy. Um, So why was I awkward? You know, I blamed it on a million things, a tall, awkward, big glasses, math Olympiad, a lot of awkward things, but I think it was just me. Um, So I had a plan when I was little and that plan was achievement. And somehow if I did enough stuff, if I accomplished enough things, somehow that empty feeling would go away. That was the dream. And I held on to that and I held on to that for a while. And then I found alcohol. And wow, that made the feeling go away a lot more quickly. (laughs) It was really pleasant. Um, You know, going to someone's wedding as a freshman in high school, falling over, passing out. I was like, this is great. I'm definitely signing up again. Um, This is that time of like Bartles and James and Zima and Boone's Farm apple wine. There was nothing fancy about this. But it seemed so novel and so special and so cool. And I felt the feeling went away. But it didn't go away forever because I still carried me around. And that was a sort of dismaying (laughs) discovery. Um, So, you know, here I was tipping away at my ultimate plan, which was, you know, creating this shield of accomplishment that would somehow protect me from feeling sad. And I was doing that with athletics and alcohol really called. So I was rowing. I was on the national team. We got third in the world. This is amazing. And here I didn't feel better. I joined uh, the next summer. They said, hey, you're going to come back, right? And I was like, hmm, you know, this is 92. Pearl Jam's 10 had just come out. Everyone was in bands or wanted to be in bands or manage a band or something. And I was like, "Mm, rowing, you know, I'm going to work at a pizza restaurant on 55th and Roosevelt and drink after the restaurant closes for the entire summer. I had an awesome summer. I thought it was just great. But like, that's a terror. That's looking back. That perhaps wasn't a very insightful choice, but that's where alcohol brought me. Um, So I went to college down in California and I thought again, that I would feel less out of place, but, you know, even out of state, it certainly feels that way. So alcohol was still there. I joined the Greek system and I would avoid people who didn't drink like the plague. My friend's boyfriend was not drinking. I met him at a party and he's like, I'm not drinking. And I was like, whoa. And I said, oh, whoa, what's up? And he's like, well, I'm trying out for the Olympics for swimming in a couple months. And the normal thing to say would be like, Hey, congratulations. That's great. I was like, Ooh, I have to go. And I like turned around and like ran away. <laughs> I was like never to speak with him again. And through med school too, I felt really apart. And you'd think, you know, getting accepted, being in this training program would be enough. And it wasn't. And I was around really bright people and I felt uncomfortable and not good enough and awkward again. It was like, shit, this is still there. But I kept telling myself, keep going, keep going. You're going to get to the end of the road. And I did my residency in New York city. And that is a place to drink. I thought, you know, in the book, Phil says that's when I had arrived and bars served till four. 
wow, that's great. I didn't have a car for seven years, totally built in this like safety net. It was after 9-11. It was pretty safe. I could like fall asleep on the subway platform and no one would bother me. Huh. It was great. <laughs> and so I really enjoyed it. And when I finally finished all my training, here I am board certified, ready to practice. I thought, okay, this is my plan, my plan from, you know, age eight. <sighs> and it didn't work. I was so dismayed to find that it didn't make me feel better about myself. It didn't make my heart calm. I still felt like my lonely little kid self just with this giant walls I'd built around myself. And I was like, wow, now I'm in this giant box. Then I truly, truly didn't know what to do. I was like, uh oh, this is not a problem. <laughs> I joined a practice on Park Avenue. I had an apartment in East Village. It was, everything seemed very styling and fancy. And again, it wasn't enough. And that's when my drinking really took off because I just didn't know. I didn't know what to do. And then I cast around for a solution outside myself. Thought maybe I should get married. I should have kids. That makes sense. Um, and I, yeah, and you can imagine I found someone who drank just like me. It was awesome. Our first date, um, I made homemade ravioli. I had theater tickets. He came down from Boston. We went out and drank, passed out at like 5 p.m. Dinner went bad theater tickets never seen. I was like, this guy's great. We should sign up for this again. Like, and I just dived in. This is great. Um, I'm from Seattle and moved back. And I thought that would somehow make me happier. It's hard to drink here. It's hard to get around. Places don't serve that late. It, there's not, this is before Uber really took off. It was hard. So I would drink and then go home and drink by myself. And then I would go out for just an hour and then take off. And by the end, I was like, I don't think I should go out. And I just tell people no and just stay home and drink wine in a box and watch the same things on Netflix over and over again. It was like the least exciting Oh, so awful. My life was just getting in this small box, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was just waiting for something to happen, waiting to wake me up and say, Hey, and at the same time, I was totally lying to myself. I biked home, just totally drunk from happy hour, fell off my bike on the slut tracks, broke all four of my fingers on my left hand. I couldn't operate for like two months. And I was like, oh, that's just the slut tracks. That is really dangerous. Everyone's like, you should sue the city. I'm like, hmm, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> in fact, I was like, oh God. <laughs> uh, my liver numbers were up with my blood tests. I saw my doctor, who's also my colleague. And he's like, hey, these numbers are up. And I'm like, huh, you know... I really think I have an ulcer. That's totally the explanation. And I just clung to these preposterous explanations of why things were so messy in my life. <sighs> yeah. And I just, first I decided, you know who the real problem is, is my spouse. And so I went to Al-Anon and <laughs> I realized, I was like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. I kind of do these things that these people are describing. <laughs> and I still to this day don't have any thought on what my ex is up to, but it's, I certainly do have a problem. So that's where I'm at. Um, so thank God I had one friend who gotten sober about four years before me. And I just called her in tears alone and well, in New Hampshire with my ex's family. So I wasn't alone, but I felt alone saying, what do I do? I like drew, got, was like, drop me off at the airport. Didn't even know, got a flight to Philly, flew home. I don't know. And I was like, what do I do? And Abby's like, okay, go to this meeting, go to Fremont Triangle at 8 a.m. on Sunday. And just like today, it was a speaker's meeting, and I took this metal folding chair by a post at the very back of the meeting and sat there and hid and just cried and cried. And I saw a girl I knew from high school, and I was horrified, so embarrassed. She saw me here, looking like a mess, and she, like, glowed. She was happy. She was calm. She looked just like she did in high school, hence I could recognize her. And I was like, whoa, this girl has some peace. What is happening? It was just puzzling, but it felt like mad. It felt hopeful. And after the meeting, she came up to me and was like, hey, Kendra, it's great to see you. And I thought I just deserved to be like shunned and left in a box alone just because that was, that was how I was. That's where I was feeling. So then when I stopped drinking, I didn't really know what to do with myself at all. So I went to bed at like eight at night with my daughter and I woke up at like six in the morning, hence my 7am meeting, which I still really like go to the gym all the time. I was afraid of the world. I would Google like how long till I feel better. 
how long till I can sleep? And it would be like, it was better at six months and better at a year. And I was like, I hate these people. No, I want this now. You know, it was not the answer I wanted, but it was, you know, it's, I'm happy I was not the first person to Google these questions, you know, when they queue in the, what did you mean? I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and I just felt worthless. I didn't, everyone's like in my home group was like, you should get a sponsor. And I was like, oh yeah. And I thought, who would want to deal with me in this ball of like dark patheticness? I, I did not feel good about myself. And so a couple of the gals in a meeting were like, that woman there, go ask her to be your sponsor. And so that's how I got my sponsor. I was like, okay. And thank God <laughs> she is the most lovely, kind person. I have the exact right sponsor for me. She's patient. She does not tell me what to do, which is good with my trouble with authority. So I appreciate all those things. <laughs> And that, you know, it didn't, it wasn't science that found me to the perfect sponsor. It was just kind of sheer luck or good advice or doing what I was told. So for the first six months or a year, I was really mad. I was mad at people who could drink. I was mad at my ex because he could drink. I could not go out to dinner, terrified. And I had to go out to dinner just for some colleague was moving out of state, nor nothing crazy about it. But I sat there at dinner and every single glass of wine, like flashed like a beacon, like blue and red the whole time. And this gal had three and she had two and I couldn't, couldn't like not stare at all of them. It was really intense for me. And I thought, oh man, this is pretty terrible. But at the same time, I was still so ashamed and I wouldn't tell my friends I was, I told my friends I wasn't drinking, but I couldn't tell them why. So I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm going through this nasty contentious divorce. I don't know. I'm not drinking ah, all, whatever. You know, I couldn't say I'm an alcoholic and I'm done. It was hard to say that. But thank God for the program because needless to say, when I got sober, it was like, I got divorced and we had this huge contentious thing. And I had to go to King County courthouse my first time standing in front of the magistrate person, these windows, there's the judges, you're at these platforms, terrifying. And thank God for the program. Cause when we were talking about custody, you know, should little girl move to Boston? All I could hear was thy will be done, not mine. And then I felt like at least it wasn't, it was out of my hands and we were fighting over the house and finances. And again, I just heard like, fear of economic security will leave me. And I learned that the economic security that I earned never made me happy and I didn't need it. So that was, that gave me a lot of peace. Still had the shame, still had the lying. And about nine months later, I went to a wedding out of state and I ended up drinking, you know, the signature cocktail, holding it politely. And that did not go well. <laughs> so don't go to weddings uh, or in early sobriety necessarily. Don't go to weddings when you're newly, dis newly divorced, I would say, is my pearls on that one. <laughs> but, or out of state, the whole thing was a mess. <sighs> but happily, I finally um, was able to be honest about that and actually honest with my friends too. And one of my high school friends said the nicest thing. I told her that I was sober and she was like, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. And I'm so sorry that you didn't tell me earlier. And I felt like I, I was just so sweet of her to say, but I also wanted to say, it's okay. Cause it got me to where I am now. And I wouldn't trade that for anything, you know? And that's why my heart was actually calm. My mom, on the other hand, she's like, I don't know, I guess that works for you, whatever. She can't deal with the idea that anything's not okay. She's from Ballard, Scandinavian, don't speak of things, <laughs> still that theme. <laughs> but it's really good to tell my friends and my, you know, kind of chosen community, things are okay. So this summer was like my first real sober summer and the sun shined brighter and birds chirped and light shined, you know, it was the first time I really noticed it. I was done with the legal stuff. I wasn't hiding things. It was really special. And one day, um, something happened. I don't know, whatever. And I just realized that I wasn't furious at alcohol anymore. That rage at alcohol, the alcohol section in the QFC went away. The talking wine on the table went away and it was okay. And I was like, some people were doing some cider tasting or something. And I was just like, that's not what I do. And it could have been, I don't know, some food I really disliked or something, but that phrase, you know, being placed in a position of neutrality, it actually happens. And that was a spiritual change. And that was not me. <laughs> that was maybe my higher power, maybe following directions, maybe working the steps. But I was so grateful to see that it actually lifted because at first I was like, no way. I mean, it took me an hour, a year. I was just listening to the talking alcohol and angry at the ads on the bus and the ads in the magazines. And I'm so happy that that didn't have to be how things are. And so I really look forward to how hopefully I will change and hopefully in a good way. I have so much 
gratitude and hope. And I wouldn't change it for anything. I wouldn't change it for, and I'm glad I'm where I am, but I'm really glad I'm sober because on my own, I'd be alone in a room fading away, you know, and I, there's nothing, there's nothing as important as that. So I'm just over the moon that I was able to find this and I found this meeting early. And when people told me which meetings to go to, I listened and I was, with that, I've got about 20 seconds, but I think I'll leave it here and say thank you. Call an alcoholic. Seems so much easier when I'm watching this process, but (laughs) (laughs) the initial instinct is through my head is like, you got to say something that keeps everybody in this room sober (laughs) or the, uh, the other um, option where is everybody's judging me. And those are those two first initial egotistical um, instincts that I have. Um, So uh, I'm here to share my story for about 15 minutes. Um, I, uh, I've been sober since 10, 25 of 2011. Uh, I have a home group called Sandpoint Big Book. I have a sponsor and I sponsor men. Uh, I say these things because those were suggestions that were given to me. um, And I think that they're instrumental in being able to stay sober for that long and include weekends in that. Um, So I think uh, when when kind of thinking how to fit it into 15 minutes, I was thinking about um, predominantly what drove me to drugs and alcohol was that feeling of restless, irritable, and discontent um, that they talk about in the book. Uh, I, uh, I felt that from a very early age. Um, for me, I thought that it was um, only kids who were undersized and had orange hair. Um, I thought that that was like why I felt like not a part of the group and why I had to like really push harder to achieve at like a different level than other people. Um, so like that happened kind of like in social interactions early on, then school came in and, um, that, uh, that infamous quote that, you know, uh, boys that think like me is you just look uncomfortable in your skin. And that's where um, I kind of slowly became the product of the psychopharmaceutical industry with, you know, let's come up with a cure for this person. Like, let's help him feel more comfortable in his skin. Uh, So that came with diagnosis um, after diagnosis from ADHD to (laughs) depression to anxiety to a point where um, I had so much trouble dealing in social interactions uh, one therapist thought that Asperger's was an option. Um, And looking back, I've kind of like can have some sort of empathy for these, um, or um, for these therapists who are trying to diagnose somebody who has the inability to be honest with themselves, let alone honest with the doctor themselves. Um, So uh, it was really kind of a tough place, but, I use that as like a place for myself to judge and, and, and get frustrated with, I can't believe my parents would put me in this situation. I can't believe doctors would think that like giving me drugs is going to make me feel more normal. It just <clears throat> further clarifies that I'm not. So, um, yeah, fast forward. Uh, I went through school. I, I think that the reason why I survived on some level is because of the extreme desire to not let people down. So I kind of rode that wave to be okay enough. Um, but then I got to college where, uh, there wasn't much accountability. Uh, and I remember like the first time I got loaded, I remember, I remember thinking in my brain, uh, thinking in my brain. Um, I remember thinking that, uh, <laughs> that like, I was like, this is the way I want to feel the rest of my life. And the thing is, is I have two siblings that when alcohol and drugs are ingested in their body, they react quite normally. Um, it's not a big deal. It's, um, it's fun. They do it the same exact reason why I do it. But when I put it in my body, I'm like, oh, like, it's like, I can finally breathe. It's like, I finally don't feel like I'm not good enough. Um, 
So that became the solution to a lot of my problems. Uh, I remember when um, I was having troubles with tests in college and I'd kind of done some geographicals, like, you know, like they say, chasing your shadow around. Um, I, uh, but I was having troubles taking tests on like a hangover or like after a night out. It was like not really working. Like for some reason, my brain just wasn't absorbing that information. And I pulled that all nighter. Granted, it was on drugs and alcohol. But like I pulled it, like I thought I did the action necessary. Um, and uh, until I realized that like if I just never really sobered up, if I maintained that and like kind of created this feeling of um, of that like warm blanket, I uh, I did all right. Like I did well on tests. So like it just further kind of cosign that idea that. Um, on drugs and alcohol, I'm a better version of myself. Um, and then I started to kind of take that along um, until uh, I started to find some success through uh, through soccer, and I and I really uh, <laughs> I really wanted to um, to be the best that I could. And I'll never forget what um, what got me to that point was. Um, I come from a, a bother, father that's very proud, blue collar roots. Um, the placard in his office is the only cliche placard that I can see in there, at least, is everything cometh to he who waiteth, so long as he who waiteth worketh like hell while he waiteth. <laughs> and that's kind of the mentality is it's like, well, let's work harder. You know, like you went 0 for 3 in a baseball game, like we, we, we hit, we hit, we hit, we hit, we practice, we practice, we practice, let's get better. Um, and, uh, I remember like the first, my first experience with like kind of buying into that principle was, um, I was like 11 in little league and, uh, and I was devastated. I went like 0 for three with like three strikeouts and, and I started to cry. Like I started to feel this like overwhelming emotion that I'm not good enough. Um, and I don't know if it was one of the assistant coaches or coaches, but like they kind of looked at me and said, you know, uh, men don't cry. They work harder. And like, I bought into that belief because I wanted, I wanted to not let people down. I didn't want to show weakness. I didn't want to feel less than, um, and, uh, accomplishing on a higher level made me feel like I was like, I was good enough. Cause I got positive affirmation. I got praised for it. Um, so when soccer came along, I got, uh, I built this world up around it. Um, and, uh, I got kicked in the leg and I, and I broke my, um, broke my leg basically from the knee to the ankle and then was in a full leg cast and, got the opportunity to lay in a bed and realize that the tools I knew how to deal with life don't work when you got to sit in your head constantly. Um, and I got to watch all these things manifest and myself just repeatedly go, you're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. Excuse me. I, I think profanity is one of the texts I wasn't supposed to do. But <laughs> I didn't wear jeans, so that's good. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I remember sitting there and just being like, what's the point? And like sitting in this melodrama where like I felt so uncomfortable. Um, and that's where the doctor goes, hey, well, you know, I know you're um, sad and um, maybe you should take this um, medication and um, it, it'll it'll help with the pain. It'll help you sleep. And so, OK, great. Um, Problem is, is I'm not somebody that like pays attention to suggestions or <laughs> doctor notes that wrap around, like take one to two tablets daily. Um, so I remember like one time I went back and he's like, dude, you're like 22 days ahead of schedule. <laughs> like I can't, I'll, I'll write you another prescription, but like if the pain's higher, we like, we got to talk about this and like come up with a solution. And um, So I did it again. And then I ran out and like that need to kind of please people. I didn't want to go to him because I knew what he was going to say. So I had some friends that were going up to uh, Canada. One of them had like just graduated law school and they were like, you know, these professional guys. And I was like, wow, they're really doing it, you know? And I went up and one of them, um, 
One of them pulled out um, some heroin at a party. And uh, I was like, oh, that's weird. Like, I've heard, like, bad people do that stuff. When I was like, no, it's totally normal. I was like, oh, okay, let's try it. <laughs> like, it was literally like, it didn't take much convincing. It wasn't like, uh, you know, like, I just kind of threw it out there, saw if you would, like, judge me, and then, like, we were on the same page. So I did it, and I got that feeling again. I got that feeling of, oh, my God, this is the way I've wanted to feel my entire life. So, um, yeah, I went through that, and uh, fast forward, I... Uh, I'll never forget walking home, and I got out of um, got out of the car, and my mom was standing out in front, and my heart sank because I was like, "Damn it, my secret's no longer a secret." Like I knew right away it was like this weird. I don't know. I've like kind of always lived as a secret, always pretended to be somebody I'm not. But like that's one of those things when you're like, "Damn it." So I'd like you to come upstairs. We have some things to talk to you about. You know, in that real slow tone. And you're like, uh-oh, she's talking to me like I'm an idiot, like something's going on. Um, so I went up, and it was all my family members, like, circled up. And they go, uh, we really love you. And, and I was like, oh, boy, this is going to be fun. And this is my first experience with, like, uh, what tough love looked like. And my... Uh, they went around the room and kind of said their piece. Um, and then they said, well, what do you think? And like I did with the best tools I had at the time. And as I said, well, you drink a glass of wine every night. You smoke pot. You look at porn. And like I even the entire playing field. <laughs> like that's what that's what I do. You know, that's how like socially acceptable in my brain is if you attack me, I even it up. Um, and it was a. Uh, it was crazy because it took my brother, who's like, who's like kind of like you can tell he's frustrated and disappointed. He's my younger brother, and he's like frustrated. And he like pauses and goes, dude, nobody does heroin like a normal person. <laughs> you know, and I think that that's, that's the recurring theme that they could, they could hear me. They could hear me kind of be like, ah, drinking's no big deal. Like everybody in college drinks like this, like whatever, everybody does this like this. But like, that was one of those things that like, um, I couldn't counter it. <laughs> um, and I'll never forget when, um, they called up my, uh, my best buddy on the phone. And he goes, I had no idea. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I think that was like my first step of willingness. Like that was my first step of like, I'm pretty much, this is not going to work out for a long time. Um, so I went into treatment and, uh, they do this thing, uh, called like family conduit or whatever. I don't know where they like invite your parents in to basically like, it felt like kicking you while you're down. Um, they're like, this is how you made me feel on this. And it wasn't good. And this is how, and I'm like, I'm here, aren't I? Like everything is like, this is not like a fun process. And, uh, and I'll never, and I'll never forget what my dad said. He looked me in the eyes and said, I'm sorry I beat you this way. And that was a tough thing to hear because I think he knew at that point that he's like, well, my mom's the only alcoholic. I'm fully responsible, and I, I just hate to see you suffer. And the feeling I have today, even when I think back on that, will not keep me sober. That's, that's the crappy part of it. I held on to that and was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I get it. Um, but I, but like the problem is, is, um, my experience continued and, uh, I couldn't keep myself away from that first drink. Like they talk about here, like, just keep yourself away from the first drink. I'm the type of alcoholic that no matter what, it's always my solution. So I need something bigger than that. Um, and that's where I got a sponsor. Um, when I asked him to be my sponsor, he's like, 
let me pray on it and I'll get back to you tomorrow. And that was like his response. And that was my first like introduction to spirituality. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I just did the hardest thing in my life and you said you want to pray about it. Um, but that man did for me um, and, and helped connect me to something that uh, I still can't put into words. Um, but yeah. My life's completely changed. I don't have um, the same fears I do. Uh, my fears today look like I'm like worried that my fiance loves me too much and she may not know me. Like those are the type of things that go through my head. Like I'm worried that like um, I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to give the information when my parents actually ask me for like. Hey, what do you think about this? You know, like things that happen, like my siblings don't worry about. It was a, it was a milestone for me when my mom started to leave the purse in the same room. That's not a big deal to my parents, but like, those are the little check marks that I was like, this is amazing. Like stuff's stuff's happening. And, uh, yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget that, um, that I have a card that I always keep in my wallet that's from my sister. And uh, she gave me $18 on a Safeway club card. $20 can buy drugs. Um, <laughs> and uh, she was taught to help me help myself. And because of that, because of uh, working in the program and learning that for me, a purposeful life is 100% gets out of my head by helping another individual. That's the starting point. Um, I've been able to stay sober for some reason when I, I couldn't figure out how to, how to string one day. And, and, and sometimes I forget because I have world problems now that I get to deal with. Um, so 15 minutes went by fast. Um, I'm, I'm thankful to be here though. And, uh, yeah. I think this is actually the first time my family's, my parents have been here. So, um, yeah, if you're going to give a round of applause, you know, give it to them. Hi, I'm Patrick. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, uh, this is my second time at this meeting. Um, last week, my first time, I was asked to uh, speak. So um, I was grateful for, you know, the honor to do that. And now I'm really nervous. Um, <clears throat> Anyhow, um, yeah, so I'll share a little bit about my experience, strength, and hope. Um, I got a ton of experience. Uh, that's first. Um, I, uh, I didn't start out as a bad boy. Um, when I was in high school, I was um, a born-again Christian. You know, I was definitely going to church like every single day almost. Um, and I went to college a sober virgin, you know, all the way. Um, I played sports, got good grades, and I was the most likely to succeed in my family, I felt. And, you know, my brothers were kind of were kind of underachievers. And so um, I was pretty confident about things, but I hadn't had a drink yet, you know. Um, and it's weird how things change. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I remember um, the first time I actually got drunk. I had had a beer before, and I was very... I thought it was very sophisticated to have a red hook, you know, a uh, single one and not feel the buzz. And of course I did. I mean, I was like 15 years old. Right. Um, but um, I didn't think I did. You know, it was like I didn't want to. I felt like um, altering your perception, your reality was morally wrong. It was sinful, you know. And uh, so I was, you know, um, but I thought that alcohol was kind of a part of growing up being an adult. So. Um, so that's kind of interesting looking back at my first beer and going, wow, you know, I would have had a buzz like today, if I had a red hook or some kind of decently strong beer, I, I would be like totally buzzed, you know? And I think my brain's just in tune to that. That's how my brain is. That's one of the ways my brain has changed, you know, as a, as a kid, I could drink one and because I didn't want to feel it, I, I didn't, you know, and it's weird how that happens. Um, but yeah, so I went off to college and I, um, I was at Western and I lived in the dorms and I didn't have many friends because, you know, I, I had a Bible study I went to, which was fine. And I was on the ski team and those were my only other friends, but they all partied really hard. 
and I didn't do that. So I, I, I and then there's this girl I had this like crazy crush on, Amy Lee, and you know, um, I tried to get her to go on a date with me, and like one kind of worked out, and uh, but she, I didn't party, you know, and so that was that, and uh, it wasn't that much fun to her, and. Um, but I remember this uh, one time um, during the winter break, we had a we had a, a week where we were just training on the mountain every day, and uh, we were driving home in the coach's uh, SUV. And he goes, and he was like a grad student, so he wasn't that much older than us. And he goes, "Hey guys, what you know? What about just getting a bunch of beer and just partying tonight?" And everyone's like, "Oh yeah, cool." And then my heart just dropped, you know, because I'm like sitting here going. Um, you know, what am I going to do? You know, like, like, I don't want it to get drunk, you know, like this is really bad. And so I remember, uh, I remember looking out the window that night and I said a prayer to God to protect me from the alcohol that I was about to consume. <laughs> <laughs> That's like so embarrassing to say, but, um, but yeah, it's good. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, um, you know, <laughs> In a way, God didn't really protect me, did he? Um, no, I think uh, I think what he, I think he wanted me to learn a larger lesson, and it's been many years. But, anyways, um, and so that night I did get I got my first good buzz on. I got drunk. I made out with Amy, you know, so I hit that one out of the park. Um, and I felt like, oh man, screw the sobriety thing. Like this is what drinking is. That's not a big deal. Like I didn't get sick. I didn't even wake up with a hangover. Um, you know, it was great, you know, and so then I was like, okay, I guess drinking isn't sinful. Um, I guess, I guess if it was that bad, I would have some message, you know, some like thing that would tell me like, stay away from this. Um, and, uh, so then I just kind of like dabbled in drinking, you know, um, I dabbled because I didn't drink very often, but God, I remember I was on all fours barking like a dog the second time I drank, you know, and I was like challenging this much older guy to like K graces, you know, or whatever. And it was, I practiced no judgment at all. Um, so yeah, I guess from the very beginning, I, like I usually said, you know, looking back, it took a while to really be like an alcoholic where I was exhibiting all these signs, you know? Um, and to some extent that's true. But when I look at the way I drink actually, like really now, like looking back with, you know, more mature or just knowing what I know, I'm like, yeah, I was, I was a wild drinker, even though I was only an occasional drinker, you know? So, um, and I don't know, like, uh, the, the drinking thing happened at a funny age for me because, you know, even though I was very, um, religious, uh, when I was growing up, I, <clears throat> I also was a little too liberal for most churches and I had just this different outlook, you know, my best friend was gay. And so like, it, you know, a lot of, you know, you had some mixed signals when, when it comes to like church accepting, you know, uh, people sometimes and whatever it was, um, by the time I got to college, I just met more conservative, um, Christians rather than, you know, more progressive. That was just my story. And so then I just kind of detached from the church. I just figured that the more I was learning about the world, the, the less that fit into it. And, um, you know, I don't believe people become alcoholics because, you know, they have no spirituality. Like I don't, I don't believe that because I know of priests and, you know, people who are like, you know, monks and stuff that get become alcoholics. I mean, I've heard of all stories, you know, um, but um, nonetheless, I don't know if this will make it a little better. Um, nonetheless, I, I do feel like there's some connection there that um, was important. I don't know, like, or that disconnect between, <clears throat> you know, um, like having a, a way to find a deeper truth and to connect, you know, with myself, um, right at the same time as I was, you know, picking up substances, which were helping me to detach myself completely, you know? Um, and, uh, I think if it had just been that, if I just, if I wasn't um, an addict in the making, you know, I could have graduated through my twenties and just gotten my shit together. Oh, got my stuff together. Um, sorry. Um, and well, the saying just works better when you say that word. I don't know why, but, um, <clears throat> anyways, so, uh, but yeah, and, but that's not what happened, you know, um, very quickly after, um, after I started drinking, probably within the next couple of years, I was drinking, um, you know, pretty alcoholically, you know, and it's funny, I remember I was in college and one of my fraternity brothers, cause by this time I had joined a fraternity, um, but, um, you know, he had, he had said to me, um, you know, we're kind of worried about you. We think you might be an alcoholic, you know, and I was so pissed off. But but that's what's funny is that like, I mean, I was in a setting where people drink 
abusively like quite a bit. And <laughs> and I thought that was ridiculous. And I'm like, just because I like to have a beer while I'm doing my chore or, or whatever, you know, uh, vacuuming the, the hall with a beer in my hand. And I thought, you're, you're just upset because I can drink like functionally and you all you guys are alcoholics. Um, and, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And so I think we're all pretty messed up anyway. But um, <clears throat> But, you know, um, I, I found myself compromising my own moral standards um, pretty early, too. And that was, I think, where um, shame came into, the, came into play. And that's where I think the addiction kind of turned in on itself. Um, I think shame for me has a huge part in my, in my disease um, because it's not just that there's something unhealthy about the way I process alcohol or the way I, I deal with certain uh, situations, but... It's the shame that keeps me from seeking help and um, keeps my egoic, you know, like rational brain like seeking for other answers, you know, and trying to explain things away. Um, and shame, I was raised with a bit of shame. Um, I, a lot of us probably were, but, you know, that definitely was a, a role. And that's a larger family thing. The more I learn about my family these days, the more I learn shame has been a, one of the constants, you know. And so I was raised with a large amount of shame. Um, you know, it's the, it's the difference between saying you did something bad and you're bad, you know? And, um, I think I never was able to separate those things. Um, even today I struggle a lot with that, even at work, you know, and in relationships. Um, but yeah, so when I was in college, you know, I had a girlfriend that I loved and, you know, we were a great couple and we were very close. And when I drank, though, I would flirt with anything that walked on two legs, you know? I mean, I was basically such a, I mean, I was somebody that I wasn't really, you know what I mean? When I was sober, I, I didn't want to be some, what's a good word without swearing, you know? But I didn't want to be that guy, you know? And, uh, and I wasn't, you know? That's the thing. Like, I knew, I knew I wasn't. And yet I would, I would make very poor judgments. You know, I did cheat on her a few times and, and, you know, and those had really bad ramifications, you know, and, and I hid that for a long time, too, because of shame. Like, I can't believe what a monster I've become when I'm getting drunk. And then I became abusive with her, which also, if you if you knew me, like, I'm, I'm not someone who easily, like, bros out and, like, you know, gets in people's faces and stuff like that, you know. So it's weird to think, you know, of me being violent or me being, like, a screamy kind of person, you know. So, um but I didn't know what to do with it. See, I wish I, I wish I had more education, I think, or just maybe I wish I had access to AA when I was younger. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it probably just wasn't my time, you know, but, but I, but I, but I wonder now if I'd had, um, some access to recovery, you know, um, how things may have been different for me. Um, because certainly at the time, the last thing I thought of was that I might be an alcoholic, you know? Um, and so, um, I mean, to me, it was like, my, where did my brain go with that? You know, it was like, well, I don't love her. I, we must not be right for each other. Oh, then there's a million other reasons, you know, and uh, and all this stuff. Um, so anyways, you know, and then after college, um, I'll, I'll kind of fast forward. I mean, basically, yes, in my 20s, I did a lot of drugs. I drank more. Um, and and then for me, I, I've had issues with other substances, Um you know, and so that was that. But I actually, in, in a certain setting, I looked pretty normal. Like, you know, I had a corporate job. I got promotions, had a car, had a cool place to live. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends, you know, and, and most of them were an addicts, um, which um, to me is interesting. Like I still like um, like a lot of the friends that I kept, you know, from before, like they're totally fine now. They have families, they have good jobs and they're not, um, they didn't have the the weird struggles that I had later on. Um, so I don't know how I managed to get so many normies as friends. Um, but, you know, um, things started really getting bad for me. Um, I would say that another substance besides alcohol, probably um, I can see where drinking took a sharp turn because alcohol became a medicine to, to ease the pain from other things. You know, um, it was, if anything, I thought alcohol was the least of my problems. Alcohol was the solution when you're coming down off of other things, you know, and, um, you know, it was practically like water at that point. Um, and so I did see my, uh, my, my drinking escalate. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, you know, um, my life was becoming more unmanageable. I mean, I would, I remember, you know, I had my first meltdown in a bar, like, like drunken tantrum, you know, with my friends. And I thought, well, that was weird. 
uh, that's what alcoholics do, you know, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it was funny, but, um, and then, and then, um, you know, I left a job, you know, kind of in a tantrum too, you know, it was a job I'd had for a while and, um, certain things weren't going very well and they weren't probably everybody at work was a little bit unhappy, but I just, I left, I quit like on the moment and walked out of there, took my 401k and just started drinking more. And um, I don't advise that. It's not a good financial plan for retirement. <laughs> I had a lot of money in there, too. And uh, But it was fun. It was a fun seven months. Um, <laughs> yes, it was. And then, um, But then pretty soon I'm like, you know what? My plan to like have all day to look for a job, I didn't really look for a job that much, you know? And, um, and so anyways, I um, – wow, I have two minutes left. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I guess where I'm going to probably uh, steer this to is that um, I did not get sober very quickly. You know, I mean, when I first I remember the moment I first had that wake up call that I was sick. You know, for me, I, I compare the moment I realized that alcoholism is real and that I have it with that moment when, you know, like when you're when you're kind of hot and you're a little bit tired and you're like, no, no, I'm good. And you're like, well, I, I think maybe I should open up a window and then it just hits you. You're like, oh, I have the flu. I'm coming down with something like I need to like take to Advil, not go out tonight and just go to bed. You know, it's that common sense moment where you just fully realize that you're sick. You know, something's not right. And I had that moment standing in my apartment. I remember the wallpaper I was staring at as I was like swaying. It was like 730 in the morning. And I just knew I'm like, oh, this is real. I can feel it coursing through my veins. I feel my brain vibrating on a different frequency. Like I knew, you know, like like this is real, real stuff, you know. And I went into that <clears throat> next meeting for real this time, you know, and uh, I was all in, you know, like everything that I'd heard before that I thought was crazy all of a sudden made sense. And I was like, I want more, you know, and I'm sorry <laughs> I ever scoffed at any of this, you know, <laughs> is it too late for me, you know, and uh, like, please. And, you know, that would be a great place for a story to end, you know, like, like, and now I'm sober. Thanks, guys, for 10 years. Um, no. And, um I, and that's another deal I could talk another half an hour about. But um, essentially, you know, don't take your sobriety for granted. You know, even if you know you're an alcoholic and even if you've, you've struggled a lot to get where you are, you know, never take for granted that you're here right now and that you're alive and that you're sober. You know, because I went through um, a lot of other stuff, you know, and um, and, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I don't know if I wish I could take it back because you're never supposed to have regrets. But, um, but, you know, I guess maybe my purpose is to sponsor some people and to maybe be an example of what not to do <laughs> and, um, just encourage everybody to hang on to what you have. Don't take it for granted, you know, cause it could happen to any of us. But anyways, thanks a lot. My name is Jack. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, my sobriety date is May 14th of 2011. This is my home group as of like two weeks ago. Uh, I just moved up here from San Diego, and my sponsor is Kirk Lester. He's also in San Diego. Uh, let's see. I was I was tired earlier today. I was on the treadmill. Um, I moved into South Lake Union apartment a couple months ago, and I was running on the treadmill trying to wake up. And I was looking out. You can see out onto the street, and I was looking at a crack in the street. Uh, and it reminded me of back in middle school. Like I would walk to school, and I would always look like a block or two down the street, and I would always think, if I were down there, it would be better. Like Life would be better. If I could just teleport myself down there, it would be better. Um, and that's kind of the story of my life. Like I always thought if I was over there hanging out with those people, I'd be better off. You know, If I was in that group, I'd be better. If I was over there doing this, if I had that or that or whatever, it would be better. And so I was trying, always trying to fix myself with external things. Um, I grew up in a very loving home. My parents were both alcoholic, but they loved the heck out of me and did anything for me literally and my dad actually died um, of, you know, doing things for us and working very hard as a commercial fisherman. He had a heart attack when I was 16. Um, and, you know, I didn't know how to handle it. He was my best friend and he was my rock and kind of my guide to life. Uh, and so when he died, I had always kind of escaped. Like I said, I wasn't comfortable in the present moment being here and now. I always wanted to be somewhere else. So I, I worked really hard in school and I played a lot of sports and I played a lot of video games. And I always was trying to kind of escape from reality in, in whatever way I could. Uh, and, you know, finally, when, when my dad passed away, those escape, mecha escape mechanisms that I was used to were no longer sufficient. Um, and my mom was drinking, and it seemed like it was working for her. So I said, what the hell, I'll give it a shot. 
Um, and yeah, and it worked. It worked. It worked for me for a while and, until it stopped working, and I had to add other things to the alcohol to get to the point where I wanted to be, which was numbing myself, um, so I could be okay. So I was comfortable enough in my own skin that I could go out and interact with you. Um, and and so I did that through high school. I didn't start drinking and using until late in high school, so I was doing really well. I got good grades, and I got a full scholarship to UCSD. Um, and my best friend, Chris, I hung out with him a lot. I'm going to try to get sober in about two minutes. We'll see how that goes. Um, so I, 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 was, I was drinking a lot. I was, I was smoking a lot of weed and playing video games. And finally, college rolled around, and I couldn't quit. I thought I could. I tried, but I couldn't quit. Because when I quit, I was sober. And I didn't like being sober. I really didn't like it because um, I, I had to feel and process, you know, and, and like live in reality. And, and I didn't like that at all. So I would try to go to class high and drunk and take these difficult math and computer science classes at UCSD. Uh, and it didn't work out very well. I, I spent about seven years at UCSD. I got about I got about a year's worth of credits. I lost my scholarship early on. Um, and, yeah, I had a 2.1 GPA. I should have gotten kicked out, but I didn't. Um, by the grace of God, the, I went to the dean and she kicked out like 10 people right before me and then I, I dodged a bullet for some reason. Um, anyways, and, and then my best friend ended up dying of a, an overdose of drugs that I had provided to him that I had gotten from TJ and um, I I kind of had lost, like I, I, I didn't really care if I lived or died. I didn't, I was of no use to anybody. I figured I'd be better off just gone, but I didn't have the, the cojones to really, you know, to kill myself. So I was just doing it slowly. I was going down to TJ maybe five times a week. I lived in San Diego, so I was like a 20-minute drive from Tijuana. And so I'd go down there and get whatever I needed to be okay to numb myself um, to the point where I was okay. And finally, that had some consequences attached to it because I would go down. I would get whatever I needed, and I didn't want to get caught bringing it back across the border. So I would pop a bunch of pills and drink and smoke some stuff and do all this and that, like right before I crossed. And then I would get back in my car and drive back to Pacific Beach, which was like a 20-minute, 25-minute drive. And sometimes I, I was all right. Sometimes I overshot the mark a little bit, and I ended up getting three DUIs in four months. And um, and they don't they don't like that very much. Uh, and they were trying to give me a year in jail. And um, through some a good lawyer and some other stuff, I only ended up doing 45 days. But I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous um, before I went to jail, and, and I stood up at the podium like two days before I had to turn myself in. I said, my name is Jack Tomlinson, and I'm an alcoholic, and I just got three DUIs, and I need to go to jail, and I'm scared. Um, and if you guys can, you know, take the time to write letters or come visit or anything, that would be fantastic. And, and people did. They wrote letters almost every day, you know, and they came and visited, and that was when I really first started to experience the love of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, it was such a beautiful thing. Um, I got out, and I didn't know what to do at that point, and a man who was to become my first sponsor said, why don't you try doing the steps? And so he showed me the book, and, and we started, you know, looking at it, and I, I didn't, I really didn't want to be an alcoholic, you know, I, I didn't, so our literature talks about we have two options if we're an alcoholic, if we're a real alcoholic, and that is that we can either, you know, go on to the bitter end and die an alcoholic death, or we can live life on a spiritual basis. And I didn't want to do either of those things, um, to be honest. Um, yeah, neither of them sounded very good. Uh, so so I, I, I was stuck on what I've heard referred to as step zero for about ten and a half months, and that is that is eliminating other alternatives besides those two things. I tried starting a business right when I got sober, and I figured if I worked really hard and made a lot of money, then I would be okay. Um, you know. And so I, I tried that. That didn't work. I didn't make a lot of money either, but I, I kept myself very busy, and, and that, didn't, that didn't fix the underlying spiritual malady that I have, you know. And it didn't fix all the hearts that I had broken um, and all the, you know, the people that I had stolen their security, like my, my parents, my mom, my family, my friends, you know, they were always wondering if I was going to be okay. And, and so, and I tried other things. I tried, I was a video game addict. I tried playing a bunch of video games and gambling all the time, you know, and doing all this stuff. And, and it, it numbed myself. It numbed me for a little while, but it didn't fix the, the underlying problem, um, which is my spirit, <clears throat> that it that needed to be treated. And that's what the steps are for. So I finally was at 10 and a half months. I was suicidal again. And I, I went back to this guy and he's like, well, why don't you try doing the work that we talked about 10 and a half months ago, you know, and, and so I said, all right. And, and so it was clear that my life was unmanageable and that I was powerless over alcohol and drugs also in my case um, and a bunch of other things. <clears throat> and, and step two for me was, you know, to come to believe that, that 
and a power greater than myself. And that was easy for me because I could look at the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and I could hear their stories and I could trust them. And I believed that they were where they where I was at the time and that they weren't there anymore. I could look into their eyes and see it. Um, and so that was it was easy for me to believe that there was a higher power, you know, if, if it was nothing else than like the, the collective wisdom of Alcoholics Anonymous, like the people in AA. Um, you know, step three, to turn my will and my life over to their care. That also wasn't very difficult because everything else that I had tried failed. And I think we kind of have to get to that point in sobriety. Um, we have to try all these, at least for me, my experience was that I had to try all these other things. And when none of those things worked, I finally gave in and said, all right, I've got to try this another way. Um, I've got to try this spiritual path. And then the fourth step, um, I make it, I made a list of people that I was angry at, you know, disappointed with, whatever, that when I thought about them, it caused some sort of negative reaction in me. Um, and that's what resentment is. It, it comes from the, the, the Latin word resentare, which is to refeel. So if I, if I think about somebody or something and, and I feel some sort of negative emotion, that's a resentment. So I write it down. Um, and the second column, I write down what they did, you know, what they did to me or whatever. And then we, I wrote down what it affected. And then the fourth column really was where I got free. And that was where I wrote down what my part in it was. And I realized that I wasn't a victim. You know, I put myself in a lot of these positions to be hurt, um, that the world wasn't out to get me. And I also realized that I wasn't unique by going through the fourth step. I realized that there's only so many ways we can disappoint people that we love. And there's only so many ways we can break hearts. And there's only so many ways we can you know, rob from people that care about us and, and steal, you know, do all these things that, that really disappoint the people that, that care about us. And so I, after that, the book talks about it. The fifth step promises that is that we're able to look the world in the eye again. And I, I totally, that was true for me. Like I, I came clean and I, and my sponsor told me, you know, that he had done most of the stuff that I had done uh, and that it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. I did some, some not too great stuff, but all right. So Anyway, so I, I continued on with the steps. I didn't do much with six and seven at that point. Uh, I got to eight and I, I made a list. And then it was difficult for me to make amends at first um, until I, I was kind of forced into it. And after the first amends, I I really like I got a high that I had never experienced before because I had came clean and it was a it was a positive outcome. Um, and I was able to rebuild this relationship with this person, and it was fantastic. And so that kind of propelled me into making about three-fourths of my amends. That was what I did the first time around. And then I got well, and I got good, and I um, this is almost two, almost two years of sobriety. It was suggested to me that I try to go back to school, so I, I wrote UCSD a letter and said, hey, the reason that I wasn't successful the first time around is because I was drinking and using drugs all the time, and that was why you guys wanted to kick me out, and I'm an alcoholic, and I've got almost two years sober. And if you were to reinstate my financial aid, I will not disappoint you. There's no reason I won't be successful this time around. And, and they said, all right. And so they did. And I was able to go back. And I spent the last couple of years back at UCSD in San Diego doing well. It's funny how much easier school is sober. If you're, if, if you're just coming back and you're not sure, it's, it's much easier sober. I, I wasn't the smartest person at UCSD. It's a difficult school to get into, especially for computer science. But I was at the top, like, number one in my class in at least four classes. And... It was just because I was more disciplined than almost everybody there because I did what I was taught in AA, which was we suit up and we show up regardless of how we're feeling. Um, you know, we keep our commitments. We get there early and we stay late. Uh, I didn't exactly get here early today, but um, <laughs> uh, so anyways, so I, I went to all my classes. Um, you know, I, I did all the homework. I prepared for all the lectures. And because of that, I got good grades. There was a little job fair, a tech job fair. And I went to it and I, I asked, you know, what can I do to, to prepare for this? And people said, well, you know, practice programming and get there early because it's very busy. So I got there like an hour and a half early, waited in line. I went in and there was two big rooms, very different tech companies in there. There was probably 100 total. And I asked one of the guys working there, like, which room should I go? In? And he's like, oh, go to that one. There's better companies over there. So I did. I practiced talking with a couple of recruiters from these smaller companies. And then I went and talked with some other companies. Uh, that I, you know, that I wanted to work for, and I ended up getting a couple of offers. Um, well, first of all, a couple of interviews because you talk to the recruiters, and then they they set up interviews, and then you go do the interviews. And I did that, and then I got a couple of offers. One was to work at a company down in San Diego, and another one was to come up here to Seattle. Uh, and I, I, so I, I didn't, I wasn't sure what to do. They were both good offers, and so I asked a bunch of people and prayed about it. Um, and it was clear to me by people's responses 
that I should come up here. You know, I've, I've been down in San Diego my entire life. It was time to come up here and experience something new. So I did. Um, and I came up here for an internship with Amazon last summer. I did well. I, I suited up and showed up, did what I was taught, asked how I could be of service. They were stoked. And so they made me a return offer. And that's why um, I'm back up here now. But uh, so I went through, anyways, things, we've got three minutes left. Things got good. And then I didn't finish my amends. And I was back in school at UCSD, and I was doing well, and I was living on self-propulsion again, and I wasn't going to very many meetings, and um, I was stuck in my head a lot, and, you know, what's in it for me? What can I get out of it? And it wasn't a fun place to be, and so I, I found a meeting on campus, and I got together with some other students there, and we started a group, um, a student organization for students in recovery. And it was so cool to be a part of that there and do events and feel like a part of the school because I'm, I was 10 years older than most of the students there and I had very different priorities. Um, and, and so this student organization made me feel like a part of the school. Uh, and I was able to, you know, being in recovery, I can relate to all you guys. Being with another student who was in recovery when I was a student gave us, we related on a whole nother level because we were very busy and we had similar schedules and whatever and it was difficult to fit in meetings and all that. And, and so that was super cool. And I, I went and, and um, went to all these different events and I was involved in it and I was elected to be the president of the student organization, whatever. And it was it was cool. And so I just graduated maybe like four or five months ago now. And I came up here and started working for Amazon. And I found out that they have also a meeting in a couple of the Amazon buildings for Amazon employees. And it's it's rad. So now, like, I've, I'm going to these meetings and I'm meeting other Amazon employees who are also working a lot. You know, they don't have much time to go to meetings and we can talk about recovery, spirituality, and prayer, meditation, and how we deal with um, difficult people on the workplace, you know, by, through, <laughs> like, how we pray at our desks and all that stuff, and sometimes go to the bathroom and pray and come back and then, and all that, and it's, like, it's super cool to be able to relate and identify, um, and so that's, I, like, I love being of service, it was awesome to be, to be asked to be, you know, to speak tonight, I, I love being able to share some hope, but also I wanted to, you know, I'd, I'd like this to be my home group. I like to, you know, let you guys in and let you get to know me a little bit. So I was hoping that I'd get to speak. I didn't think it would be like the third week after I started going to meetings here in Seattle, but um, but it's it's awesome. Um, so like, I've got like 45 seconds left. So Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a lot externally. Um, you know, I have a wonderful girlfriend who moved up here from San Diego with me. We actually went today and got a couple of kittens from the from the animal shelter. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to go down that path. And it, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome. But um, any, anything to make her happy. But um, but it's so, so and it's, you know, I'm making more money than I ever dreamed that I could. And, like, and I'm living in a great place, a great apartment building. And, like, I have friends again. And I've rebuilt the majority of my relationships because I've made all the amends that I'm consciously aware of. Uh, and and I've worked the steps to the best of my ability three different times with three sponsors, and it's it's super cool. But I think like one of the best things that AA has given me is a peace of mind, um, and I, I'm not afraid all the time. Like I can walk down the street with my head held high, knowing that there's nobody, there's no wrong that I've put out in the universe that I haven't tried to make right, and and that's super cool. Like I I never knew that was possible. It's a freedom that, like I said, I, I had no idea that that somebody could experience, um, and. The steps do for me today, the steps in spirituality, I say the third step prayer a lot, turning my will and my life over to the care of God. Um, the steps give me what alcohol and drugs used to give me, that sense of, of ease and comfort. And if you haven't worked the steps, I highly recommend it. Um, being of service also is another thing that's just given me such purpose. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to speak. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.